A few months ago, I was due to move in with my boyfriend of four years. I know many couples move in together far earlier than that, but we were very focused on our careers and had taken each stage in our relationship super slow, so we were certain we were doing the right thing. Cue the lockdown. It was a case of either pull the trigger on the move-in thing and to get it done as quickly as efficiently as possible, or put it off again for the foreseeable future. I wasn't prepared to do that. I wasn't prepared to spend an entirety of any lockdown stuck in my parents' house. But when we walked about, I discovered something horrendous. He had been seeing a girl in the side. Some hippie chick that he had met through his job and told me he didn't want to be together anymore. He told me I was neurotic, career-focused, but to the point of being neglectful and cold-hearted. I was broken from it, but above all, I was angry. I basically told him, like... Screw you. I'm getting all the dating apps. I'm going to find someone better than you. And I did. At least I thought I did. That's how I met this guy, Alex. He lived around the corner from me. I'm talking less than five minutes walking distance. And the more we talked, the more I was amazed that we hadn't bumped into each other before. We'd gone to sister schools, lived on the same street at one point, and had a plethora of similar interests. But when it came to meet... I got a little nervous, and here's why. I know this is bad of me, but all of my pictures are with filters or taken from a distance. They do make me look very pretty, and I suppose I am in a sense, but there's something I need to explain. I have really bad acne. I always have since I was a teenager. I have a lot of acne scars up and down my cheeks and forehead, and I get those horrible acne spots that are very, very painful to deal with properly, so... Basically, no choice to leave them be or go through inordinate amounts of pain every morning. I also have a condition known as PCOS, or polycystic ovary syndrome. PCOS symptoms can manifest in different ways. The first is the namesake follicles that can surround your ovaries can make getting pregnant very difficult. Here's one of the reasons I thought I'd be alone forever when I was a kid. Another is the excess production of male hormones such as testosterone. This means I get thick black hairs coming out of my chin, sometimes even growing from my nose, too. I like inside my nose, like on my nose. This caused me to be depressed for many, many years. I hated the way I looked, and I'm not always the best at remembering to shave or checking myself out in the mirror, for that matter. Anyway, I wore sunglasses and let my hair loose for mine and Alex's first meeting. He was really nice, and we took a walk around a local park so as to comply with the daily exercise edicts put out by the British government. We talked about stuff that we cared about, discussed our careers, and although I was still really hung up on my ex, I did really like him. We were only supposed to walk a loop around the park for like an hour, but we walked for much longer than that and ended up sitting on the grass for a while and talking. That's when I decided to bite the bullet, so to speak. Take off my sunglasses. They were the overly large kind that covered up more than just the eyes, and tie my hair back so he could really see my face. That's when his face dropped. I felt horrendous, seeing this happy, smiling face and warm gaze turn cold as he looked me over, seeing all the things that I hadn't let him during our little walk. I didn't even need to ask why, as he was looking at me like that, and I just blurted out, How more do you think I've catfished you? I said, hearing myself just drained of confidence. I half expected him to at least be a gentleman about it. Nothing about his behavior over the previous few hours made me expect anything else. But his answer made me feel like bursting into tears. You did catfish me. You don't look like your pictures at all. He said, not even bothering to look me in the eyes when he said it. We sat there in silence for a minute or so as I fought to keep back the tears. It was only like a week before I'd suffered through some of the worst heartbreak I'd ever faced, and now it was just compounding on it. I think I should just go, I said, moving to get up to walk away. But he grabbed my wrist hard, keeping me from getting up. You know, you shouldn't do this to people. It's very, very rude, he said tightening his grip on my wrist as he seemed to get angrier and angrier. I'm sorry, is all I could say, feeling myself beginning to tremble. I'm stoic usually, 
I'm good at controlling my emotions, but I was honestly on the verge of cracking up in that moment. I looked around, hoping might see someone that could help me if he started to get really, really angry. But to my absolute horror, there was no one. The sun was beginning to dip in the sky, and the park had almost completely emptied of people, worried they'd be fine for being outdoors without a good reason. It was that exact moment that I realized that I was almost completely at the mercy of this angry, obviously unstable guy. The way his mood just swung like that, it was awful. He was not the person I thought he was, and that terrified me. Girls like you are the reason dating apps are complete garbage. He growled through his gritted teeth. Girls like you are why I hate doing this kind of thing. Getting my hopes up only to be disappointed. I apologized over and over again. I told him I didn't mean to make him angry and that I just tried to pick the best photos of myself, but he interrupted angrily, telling me to shut up. I should teach you a lesson, he spat. Let's take some actual photos of you, shall we? Let's take some pictures so we can show guys what you really look like. I couldn't believe it, but he actually tried to reach for my pocket where I was keeping my phone. I just reacted. I don't know if it was the fear or the anger at being treated like this by someone I barely knew, but I hit him. More like I elbowed him right in the face, and as I did, I heard something crunch. He fell back, letting go of me and bringing both hands to his face in agony. I don't know what I'd broken, what I'd cracked, but I didn't stop to think about it. I stood up and ran away from him. He got up to chase, and in a horrible moment I realized he was gaining on me. But the next time I looked back, he was bent doubled over, handcuffed below his nose as blood poured out of it. He'd stopped chasing me, and it was only then that I burst into tears as I ran. I was an athlete in secondary school, and it all just came back to me as I ran and ran and ran and didn't look back. I don't care if my pictures weren't completely represented of me. No one deserves to be talked to or treated like that. Ever. I have recently been undertaking a course of cognitive behavioral therapy on the advice of my psychiatrist, and it involved writing an essay on the event that caused me to seek therapy in the first place. It's not something I ever planned on publishing or sharing with anyone, but it dawned on me that what happened might serve as a cautionary tale for others. And if just a little bit of light can come out of all that darkness, then I guess I should give you a chance to use it in one of your videos. Let's read. That being said, I prefer to remain at least partially anonymous if you do share this, and if that's okay with you. If you think that makes my story less believable, I understand, but it's quite a big story where I'm from when it happened, and I'd rather not draw any more attention to myself than I already have. So back in the late 2000s, after earning my teaching qualifications, I got a job at a middle school in a major Midwestern city. Teaching turned out to be a career full of surprises. I was surprised how quickly I was able to land a job, surprised how horribly understaffed and underfunded we were, and surprised at the kids' capacity for sheer cruelty. I was swamped with work, incredibly stressed out, and admittedly very lonely. I wanted to date, I just didn't have the time. So when I heard about a little website called Plenty of Fish, my curiosity was piqued. I set up a profile, trying not to make my About Me section too cringy, then I set about browsing the profiles of local singles. There were a lot of attractive, interesting young women, an intimidating amount, actually, but as much as I tried, I couldn't seem to hold their attention long enough to actually secure a meetup. But then finally, just when I was starting to think that the whole thing was just some lost cause, I got a message from a girl named Lyra. Lyra was a petite Hispanic girl with curly brown hair and big amber eyes. She was charming, intelligent, and we soon swapped email addresses for more in-depth conversations. She said that she was working as a waitress downtown, had an interest in fashion, but also read a lot of books that she was kind of embarrassed about. When I asked why, she didn't tell me in case I thought she was weird. At that point, very little could have put me off this girl, but she told me that she had a huge interest in serial killers. And I just about jumped for joy. Not only did I somewhat share her interest in criminology, but a kooky interest like that was something that we could really bond over. At least... That's the way it seemed to me at the time. 
We traded a few more pictures of each other, some a little racier than others, but nothing nude or X-rated or anything like that. I thought she was pretty. She said I was handsome, and before long, we were planning to meet in person. Between matching and the day of our planned meeting, Lyra and I talked almost all day, every day. We talked about our lives, our hopes for the future, our families, and dating history. I was almost 27 at the time, and she told me that she was 22, but despite the age gap, we got along very well, and I got more and more excited to meet her. We agreed to meet for coffee one Sunday afternoon, so I drove out to the parking lot of a Starbucks in her neighborhood, gave her a description of my car, and then waited for her to show up. We planned to meet for 2 p.m., but when 2.15 came and went and Lyra hadn't showed up, I started to get a little worried. I texted her, but she assured me that she was only minutes away, so I just leaned back in the driver's seat of my car and started playing with my phone to pass the time. I obviously wanted to be able to see who's approaching my car, so I'm backed into this parking space facing whatever strip mall the Starbucks was in. I can see anyone and everyone who might approach my car, but every time I look up from my phone, there's no sign of Lyra. Then at one point, I look up to see this guy walking towards the parking spaces where I'm at. There are other cars parked next to me, so I figure that he's just going to get into one of them before driving off. Only, he doesn't. I see him stop in front of my hood on the edges of my vision, and so I look up again to make eye contact with him. The guy's maybe a few years younger than me, dark hair and eyes, and a little shaved beard and mustache combo around his mouth and chin. He sort of checks me out for a second, takes a look around him, and then pulls out a small digital camera from his jacket and starts snapping pictures of me. At first, I just gave him this exaggerated look as if to say, What are you doing, dude? The honking my horn didn't stop him either. I rolled down my window, intent on telling him to get lost, but as soon as I did, he makes a beeline for my driver's side and begins talking to me in a low voice. Strangely enough, I can remember exactly what he said, not word for word. I think he was only two or three sentences in before my head started swimming and I felt like I was going to throw up. It sounds exaggerated right now, I know, but you just wait. Basically, it went a little something like this. He addresses me by name, which is what initially stunned me into silence. And then he says something like, I don't think you want to make a scene here. You don't want people to find out you've been talking to my 17-year-old sister, especially not the school board. Has anyone ever said anything to you that made your whole entire self just stop for a couple of seconds? The only other thing I can compare it to was when I got the news that my dad suddenly passed. It's like everything stops for a few moments. The world keeps going, but you're just stuck in that one moment longer than everyone else is. In movies and on TV, they try all kinds of things to mimic what it feels like. The first episode of Breaking Bad, for example, when Walter goes temporarily deaf when he gets the news about his cancer. TV producers try to capture that feeling in a thousand different ways on a thousand different TV shows, but they'll never really convey what it's like. You gotta feel it for yourself. And realizing that I've been tricked, catfished, if you will, into something that can destroy my entire life. Trust me, you don't want to know what that feels like. As you can probably guess, I hadn't been talking to any 17-year-old. I've been talking to the guy who was now demanding to be let into my car. Hell, I don't even know if this girl in the pictures was his sister or not, but we both knew that that wasn't important. All that mattered was what it looked like. And I know this guy could selectively screenshot a few portions of our email exchange to make me look very much like the predatory villain going after the innocent underage girl. That might sound strange to some. All I ever wanted to do was teach. I had an amazing high school history teacher who inspired me to do the same, so it, it might sound strange to some, but all I ever wanted to do was teach. I had an amazing high school history teacher who inspired me to do the same, so it might seem like an unambitious goal to some, but it's all I ever wanted as a career. My blackmailer knew that, and it made me a much richer target. They didn't have to mine enough dirt to hold the prospect of arrest and imprisonment over me because the school board would ensure that I never worked another teaching job in my life if there was even the whiff of predatory behavior about me. He had me by the proverbials, as they say. I knew it, and he knew it too. And then over the course of the next few weeks, 
He must have bled me for at least a thousand dollars before I finally got a grip of myself and went to the cops. Now, I won't bore you with each individual exchange. Just know that each one came with a reminder of what he had over me, and at the time, I didn't think that I had any real recourse. I fooled myself into believing that if I paid him a few times, if I just gave him that few thousand he believed that I owed him, that the guy would find a new mark and move on from me. But he didn't. The first rule of blackmailers, you never let them blackmail you. Otherwise, you'll never get rid of them. You let people use you like a human ATM and shock and horror, they don't like the idea of suddenly losing it. One whiff that I was about to hold out on him and the guy threatened my life. After that, I had no choice but to either pack up and move or go to the cops. And after reviewing the conversations I had with Lyra, I decided to stand up for myself. For the first two weeks or so, I was too shell-shocked to actually take a step back and analyze what I'd said and done. I wanted to delete my Plenty of Fish account, sometimes more than anything in the world, but I was too scared and ashamed to even log in. But then, after I realized my life might legitimately be in danger if I suddenly became unable or unwilling to pay, it motivated me to revisit Lyra's conversation history. I wasn't talking to a 17-year-old girl. I mean, I wasn't even talking to a girl. I didn't even know if the girl in the pictures was underage, as there was no matches in the results of multiple Google image searches. And that was the start of me going down this major rabbit hole regarding blackmail and cybercrime. Every single self-declared expert said the same thing. Even if you legit had done something illegal, you have to be the first to approach law enforcement if you're being blackmailed. It sounds stunningly petty that it came down to something as simple as who files the first report. But justice is indeed blind, for better and worse. And when I actually sat down with two detectives who worked extortion cases like mine, they said it was probably one of the least embarrassing cases they'd ever dealt with. Smarter, richer guys than me have been quite literally caught with their pants down, and that alone was reason enough for some of them not to involve the law. The others were doing something legitimately incriminating. One of the detectives told me about a guy who was actually looking to prey on underage girls. One girl's father found out, blackmailed the guy until he hung himself because he couldn't pay anymore. Some might call that justice, but blackmail is illegal, no matter who the victim is. In the end, what it came down to was if I could survive whatever accusation this guy would make, there was a good chance that when his arrest got traced back to me, whatever material he was hanging over my head was going to get released. Legally, I was going to be fine, but as we know, it was the school board's judgment that really mattered. And sadly, this story doesn't have a happy ending. My blackmailer ended up getting arrested in a sort of sting set up to catch him, and I testified against him in court. But before I even got my day in court, every school in the district got a big brown envelope in the mail containing some heavily doctored images of my Plenty of Fish profile, the conversations with Lyra, and the predatory accusations that had milked almost two grand out of me. The detectives I spoke to were kind enough to contact the school board themselves, assuring me that the packages amounted to false evidence in the blackmail case. They were understanding. The kid's parents, however, they weren't so eager to accept the nuance of the situation. The school board tried to make my case, but it didn't matter. No smoke without fire was the general consensus, and I was given a choice by the school board. Resign and move on, and I'd get a clean recommendation from them for my next teaching job, or stay and be forced out in a way that'd be a black mark on my record for the rest of my career. When they put it like that, there was no choice in it at all. I've tried to move on with my life, and in some ways, I've been very successful. But in others, I'm still very sorely lacking, hence why I'm writing all this down in the first place. Maybe one day I'll be able to shake off the trust issues that this Lyra gave me, and I'll be able to finally start dating, like I tried to so many years before. I'll always be scared. I'll always be anxious. But all I can hope is those feelings dampen over time, until I can finally get rid of this cursed feeling and earn the love that I know in my heart that I deserve. I recently discovered your YouTube channel and I've been binging your videos, but I'm also really broke right now. So instead of sending a super chat or becoming a channel member, I figured that I'd show my appreciation by 
sending a story that you can actually use. So this happened in Vermont in the late 90s sometime, 98 or 99, I think. And it's a true story, so you can go research it to confirm I'm not making up a bunch of bull. Now, having said that, please forgive me for any inaccuracies. It's been a long time since I talked about this with anyone. If I get dates or little details wrong, that's totally on me, but I can promise you what you're about to read is true, as true can get. So back when I was in high school, there was this kid in my homeroom class named Chris who was always into some kind of hustle. For example, there was a time he must have made literally hundreds of dollars selling counterfeit cassette tapes. I personally bought the Weezer album Pinkerton from him, and he only got in trouble when a teacher was caught buying one of his tapes. The teacher got fired, whereas Chris only got a detention, and then he was back and selling loose cigarettes in no time. This really did get him in trouble, though. Showing a little misdirected entrepreneurial spirit is one thing, but profiting from getting freshman kids hooked on smoking was something else in my mind. He ended up getting suspended for a while, but I think that his mom pleaded his case to the principal because he managed to avoid outright expulsion. When he returned from the suspension, Chris was a changed man and appeared to have completely cleared up his act. But as the saying goes, appearances can be deceptive. Instead of running hustles that could easily be traced back to him, Chris found a way to elevate his game, and it all centered around the school's computer lab, along with its brand new internet access. So, Chris might have been a grifter, but it turned out that he wasn't nearly as dumb as we all thought. All he needed was the right tools. Chris spent more and more time in the computer lab, all under the guise of cleaning up his act. The teachers figured that he'd found his calling or whatever and just sort of left him to it. We all heard that he was building a website or something, or at least learning how to. I remember thinking that was pretty cool, but Chris was always super cagey about talking about it. For some reason, Chris was also super into CB radios, too. I remember him having an actual picture of one in his locker. He was very proud of the fact that he was building one, piece by piece, in his mom's garage. And not just any old CB radio, either. The most powerful civilian model in the entirety of the United States. When people asked why he'd want something so nerdy, he said that he wanted to have the range to be able to prank any CB user in the country. He pretended to be little kids in trouble or whatever and then laugh his butt off when they started freaking out and panicking. I don't know if we ever really believed him on that. It was kind of funny, I guess, but also way too elaborate when you could just use payphones for prank calls. But little did we know, Chris was telling the truth, and he'd come up with a very illegal way of doing it. Basically, Chris would visit these internet chat forums set up for CB radio enthusiasts, and he'd pose as a legitimate CB radio trader. I heard that he played it pretty smart, too, renting a P.O. box so the hustle wasn't connected to his parents' place and doing all of his communication by email so no one heard it was just some kid instead of a grown man. He'd reached out to someone looking to sell a part that he needed, claiming to be this fake trader, but instead of just offering cash for the item on sale... Chris would offer them any replacement part, claiming that he could source just about anything. Most guys just told him to screw off, but every so often, someone agreed to straight up swap and was dumb enough to mail him whatever part he needed. After that, Chris just stopped answering their emails and moved on to his next target. Kind of smart if you think about it, if only in a fiendish kind of way. But much like a lot of endeavors like that, it was only a matter of time before someone figured out a way to get back at him. And boy, did they ever get back at him. One day, Chris goes to pick up the package from his P.O. box and finds that there's not one, but two boxes inside. He's working multiple targets at one time by this point, so it wasn't a nice, but not entirely unexpected surprise. He grabs both boxes, throws them in the back seat of his mom's car, and then drives back home to open them. His mom's in the house at the time, and she's in the same room when Chris started opening up the boxes. He opens one up, and there's radio parts inside. But when he opens up the other, there's another smaller box inside, and when he opens that smaller box, boom. Chris's mom watched her own son turn into mincemeat right there in front of her and the explosion put her in the hospital for days afterwards. One of Chris's targets hadn't just been content to eat his loss, 
and then come up with a horrifyingly poetic way of getting back at him. I guess the guy could have just called the cops and given them the P.O. Box number because, although this was back during the Wild West days of the internet, I'm pretty sure what he was doing was still wire fraud in some way. But it turns out, this dude couldn't wait to see Chris in cuffs, so he decided on a little vigilante justice instead. This guy spent months learning how to build a small, powerful explosive device, testing out trigger mechanisms and power yields or whatever, until he finally had one that would ship, explode, and kill the first person who opened it. I think the guy was from Iowa or Idaho or something, somewhere way across the country, and I know he ended up going to prison for it because it was all over the newspapers here in Fairhaven. I guess the whole thing had really affected the way I look at the internet as I became an adult. Not only are there tons of people online who just aren't who they say they are, but there are also something legitimately scary about the internet's power to connect people. Sure, it has this amazing power to connect people in a positive way, people who never would have ended up connecting otherwise. But it also opens us up to all kinds of negative interactions too. There are a whole lot of psychos out there in cyberspace, and if you make them mad, it can have deadly real-life consequences. In May of 2005, a very bored ex-Marine decided to take advantage of the Internet's anonymity to do something very unsavory. 46-year-old Thomas Montgomery, a married father of two, logged on to an Internet chat room for teenagers named Pogo and set up a profile depicting a kind of alternate version of himself. In his heyday, Thomas had spent a few years in the United States Marine Corps, but had been discharged in his mid-twenties with medical issues. In light of that, he chose a username that somewhat exaggerated his role in the services, Marine Sniper. Using an old photograph of himself and Marine Corps fatigues, Thomas posed as an 18-year-old jarhead sniper bound for the battlefields of Iraq in the coming months. He soon received a message from a user named Tall Hot Blonde, an 18-year-old girl who wished him luck on his fictional tour of Iraq. I kept thinking, well, we're never going to meet, Thomas later said. I'll just play the game with her, he said. Before long, their careless flirtations blossomed into something increasingly deeply meaningful. Tall Hot Blonde soon revealed that her name was Jessie, a high school senior from West Virginia with a passion for horses and softball. Thomas, on the other hand, painted her a picture of covert operations and elite special force units. In reality, he never once saw a shot fired in anger. He described himself as a stronger, more virile version of the real-world Thomas, standing at a muscle-bound six feet tall with bright red hair and icy blue eyes. The description prompted Jesse to send what was described as some very provocative photos. His plan to win a little female company appeared to be working like a charm, but his dependence on the buzz it gave him soon became unhealthy. It became more real to me than real life, Thomas later said, and he proved to be as generous as he was affectionate. He sent Jesse gifts of cash and jewelry, and the pair supplemented their online conversations with perfumed handwritten love letters. It wasn't long before Thomas was arranging his schedule around his talks with Jesse, to the point that it became a debilitating addiction. If I was smart, I would have just ended it, he later said. But it was like a drug, a drug that I needed every day. By this time, Thomas's online relationship wasn't just taking over his life, it was taking over his mind, too. On January 2nd of 2006, he wrote a note in a digital journal that he appeared to have been keeping, and it read, Today... Thomas Montgomery, 46, ceases to exist. He is replaced by an 18-year-old battle-scarred Marine and is moving to West Virginia to be with the love of his life. He was clearly on the verge of a psychotic break, and as a result, his attempts to hide the affair from his family became increasingly lackadaisical. Finally, in March of 2006, Thomas neglected to log out of his Pogo account, and his conversations with Jesse were discovered by one of his daughters, Confused as to who this younger woman was, Thomas's daughter showed her mother, and she was furious. Having made a note of Jesse's home address, 
Thomas's wife wrote her a handwritten letter exposing her husband for the manipulative fantasist that he was. She enclosed a photograph of their family, having written on the back, let me introduce you to these people. That's me. These are our daughters. But the man in the center is Tom, the one you've been talking to. He's not 18. He's 46. And he's been my husband since 1989. Jesse was horrified and broke off the relationship with Thomas immediately. I hate you, she said in a hastily typed text. You should be in jail for this. Thomas was left to deal with the fallout of his digital infidelities, believing his relationship with Jesse was over and done with. But meanwhile, unbeknownst to the Montgomery family, Jesse set about verifying the whole story by contacting one of Thomas's co-workers. 22-year-old part-time machinist Brian Barrett found himself the surprise recipient of an email from Jesse, and once again, an online romance rapidly blossomed. Given their similar ages and interests, Jesse and Brian were a much better fit for each other, with the latter becoming a shoulder to cry on after confirming the former's worst fears. They talked for a few months, becoming more and more flirtatious until Brian asked Jesse to be his girlfriend. After a series of long-distance telephone calls confirmed that Brian was indeed real, Jesse planned for the couple to meet that summer. The future looked bright, at least until familiar usernames slid into the young woman's DMs. It was from Marine Sniper, and the message simply read, I miss you. As much as Jesse had been disgusted at Thomas's deception, she couldn't deny that she'd missed him. Thomas was a liar, but he had a way with words, and Jesse was a sucker for silver tongue. She welcomed her former beau's return, but she was honest about her relationship with Thomas's co-worker, Brian. As an older, married man, she expected Thomas to take the news in stride, but she was wrong. Thomas's messages became frighteningly violent as he claimed that Brian would pay in blood for, and I quote, taking what belongs to me. When Jessie defended her new boyfriend, Thomas turned on her too, calling her names that she would later describe as shockingly abusive. For Jesse, having someone that she had a deep affection for turn so suddenly vile was beyond upsetting, and unsurprisingly, she sought comfort in Brian. In retribution, Thomas took to the chat rooms Thomas still frequented, outing him as a middle-aged freak, and in some cases, accusing him of being a predator to children. Ironically, such extreme measures actually pushed Jesse back into Thomas's digital arms, as just after instances of chat room slander, she sent him a short, six-word message. I ache to be with Tommy. Documentary filmmaker Barbara Schroeder later described the ensuing conversation as Thomas's jackpot. He was being accepted for being 47, she later said, and he still had this attractive young girl wanting him now. The only trouble was, Thomas was trying to have his cake and eat it too. In the aftermath of his online affairs discovery, Thomas had begged his wife not to leave him. Somehow, perhaps due to the lack of physical infidelity, he managed to save his marriage and promised his wife he'd cease any lurid online activity. Yet it wasn't long before the same old craving set in, and eventually, Thomas returned to his old patterns behavior. He had no intention of losing his wife and children, but he was also dangerously addicted to his conversations with Jesse. To hide his activities from his wife, Thomas began talking to Jesse until the small hours of the morning, sacrificing his sleep and, in turn, his mental health in exchange for time with his online paramour. Once again, the obsession began to take a toll on his mental health. The more they talked, the less he slept, and the less Thomas slept, his grip on reality began to weaken. Finally, after weeks of almost constant talking, Jesse realized that she and Thomas had no future together, and she bravely broke things off with him during a long and heartfelt chat exchange. Jesse clearly hadn't learned from her first attempt to romantically reject the middle-aged ex-marine. Thomas had been unhinged before, but now he was absolutely psychotic. Behavioral therapists who later dealt with Thomas described him as frightening and that the final rejection had sent him into an abyss. For weeks, Thomas stewed in a mix of hatred and a raw desire for revenge, some believe that he deserted the chat room altogether, having been outed and humiliated not once, but twice. 
But Thomas wasn't gone. He was simply lurking, watching, waiting. As time went by, Jesse once again proposed a meeting with 22-year-old Brian Barrett. The invitation delighted him. His serendipitous internet romance was finally about to blossom into something tangible, something real, and he couldn't have been more excited about it. Yet Brian went on to make a fatal error of judgment, one born out of innocent desire to share his good news with others. Brian was now very active in the Pogo chat rooms, having been introduced to them by Jesse. He'd made a bunch of new friends, all of which knew Jesse and who were over the moon when they heard the news that they were going on their official first date. The thing is, these messages were shared in what was called the main chat, as opposed to direct or private messages. This meant anyone in the chat room could read and react to Brian's good news, including people lurking under assumed or random number usernames. People like Thomas Montgomery. On the afternoon of September 15th, 2006, Brian Barrett finished his workday, closed out his shift, and then walked out into the parking lot towards his car. Out of the corner of his eye, Brian noticed a man standing by a white truck, a man who seemed to be staring at him as he fished around for his car keys. Brian shot the man a look, but didn't recognize him. Yet moments later, the man called out for his attention. Brian looked around for a second time, but on this occasion, the man was holding a long-barreled, semi-automatic rifle. It was Thomas. According to witnesses, the armed man stated something to the effect of, should have stayed away, before three shots rang out. Brian was dead before he hit the blacktop. Police learned of the bizarre love triangle from Brian's co-workers, who were very familiar with his rivalry with Thomas, but while he remained on the loose, Jesse wasn't safe. The police poured over Brian's pogo message history to track down any trace of Jesse's address, and when they did, they raced over to her property to ensure that she was safe. This is where police were in for yet another surprise, because instead of Jesse or her parents answering the door, a woman named Mary Sheeler greeted them instead. The officers demanded to know where Jesse was, but a frightened Mary Sheeler claimed to have no idea what they were talking about. When the officers made it clear that a man was on his way to kill her, Sheeler broke down. There was no Jesse, or more accurately, she had been masquerading as the bubbly 18-year-old the entire time. Jesse's pictures were of those of Mary's teenage daughter, who had no idea her mother was using them to catfish men online. And after cooperating with the police, Mary helped law enforcement bring Thomas Montgomery to justice. He later pled guilty to the murder, but in exchange for his plea, he received a reduced 20-year sentence instead of the death penalty. Prosecutors later attempted to charge Mary Sheeler as some kind of accessory to the crime, but the incident exposed gaping holes in the fight against cybercrime and internet deception in general. Some assert that she deliberately provoked the violence and that she delighted over the idea of two men fighting for her. Yet, in an interview with the BBC, Mary argues the contrary. It was stupid. It should have never happened. I just never thought that it would go anywhere, she said. I honestly thought that it would end, fall off, and that would be the end of it. I didn't want anyone to get hurt. Despite dodging charges, Mary didn't come away unscathed. Her own husband later divorced her over the incident, and the use of her daughter's pictures caused a rift that has yet to properly heal. We can't blame Mary Sheeler for the actions of Thomas Montgomery. Both were fantasists, but only one chose to pick up a firearm as a way of hurting the other. It's just a shame that an innocent young man had to be a kind of sacrificial lamb, a blood tribute to conclude a relationship based on lust, lies, and loathing. Casey Renee Woody was born on October 17th of 1989 in Little Rock, Arkansas. She was the only daughter of Rick and Christy Woody, and although she lost her mother at a young age, she grew into an intelligent, talented young lady. Friends described her as a kind of caring girl who loved singing, dancing, and playing her saxophone. By 2002, the Woody family lived in the rural Arkansas town of Holland, 
a heavily forested area that relied on a nascent internet for communication. As a result, 13-year-old Casey kept in touch with friends using Yahoo Messenger under the username Model Behavior. However, it wasn't just close friends Casey talked with online. Since late 2001, Casey had been kindling a friendship with 17-year-old David Fagan, with the pair having bonded over the loss of loved ones. Two of Casey's close friends, Sam and Jessica, also added David to their Yahoo friends list. Yet while he made an effort to come across as a charming, well-intentioned young man, Sam was not fooled. She might have been just 13, but she was wise enough to recognize that something was wrong. No 17-year-old in their right mind would even think of becoming romantically involved with someone four years their junior, and the fact that David had never called or sent a verifiable picture made her even more suspicious. She advised Casey not to get too attached to David. Sadly, she didn't listen. Rick Woody, Casey's father, worked grueling, 11-hour swing shifts as a police officer, meaning he wasn't home enough to effectively monitor her internet activity. Rick knew that Casey talked to boys in online chat rooms, but wasn't overly concerned about it. He trusted that his daughter was making friends within her age group, and talking online was much safer than meeting in person. Yet when he discovered that Casey was talking to someone in their late teens, he was furious. Rick banned his daughter from any further communication with David, but Casey simply circumvented the ban by calling David long distance. One night during the summer of 2002, Casey and her friend Jessica were having a sleepover at the Woody family home. Sometime in the early evening, the phone rang. Casey answered the call. It was David. The pair engaged in a little small talk for a while, until suddenly, Jessica heard a strange sound coming from downstairs. She walked out of Casey's bedroom and over to the top of the stairs, listening out for any further noises. And that's when she heard the telltale sound of a kitchen floorboard creaking underfoot. Jessica hurtled back into Casey's room, closing and blocking her door with a nearby dresser. Casey descended into a panic when she realized someone was in the house with them, and she expressed fears to David, who was still on the phone with her. David told her not to worry, that no one was in the house and that they'd both be fine. After that, the noises stopped. Sometime after this incident, Casey began communication with a Yahoo user named Taz2999. Taz claimed to be a 14-year-old football player named Scott, who resided in Alpharetta, Georgia. The pair spoke for a while before Scott asked Casey to be his girlfriend, and having learned from the David debacle, she insisted that Scott send her a picture. Minutes later, an email arrived in Casey's inbox. It was from Scott, and attached to it was a picture of a handsome teenage boy wearing a football uniform, and she was smitten. Then, on the morning of December 3, 2002, Casey's friend Sam noticed Scott's picture hanging in her locker. She was delighted to hear that Casey had found a boyfriend, but was dismayed to hear that it was another semi-anonymous online relationship. Once again, Sam warned Casey of the dangers associated with online strangers. Only this time, Casey became confrontational. She didn't appreciate her friend's attempt to mother her and accused Sam of toxic jealousy before storming off to class. Without Casey's knowledge, Sam approached their school's counselor to warn them of her reckless behavior. But rather than approach the situation delicately, Casey was dragged into the principal's office for a stern lecture on stranger danger. Casey insisted that she didn't give out any personal information, something we know is false based on her phone conversations with David. For some reason, the teachers then decided to bring Sam into the office to out her as the one who'd warned them of Casey's behavior. She was furious but hid her rage to convince teaching staff that the pair had reconciled. The two girls didn't talk for the rest of the school day, but just after the bell rang, Casey caught Sam at her locker, only to extend a very unusual invitation. Casey proposed the two girls have a sleepover that same evening, but since it was a school night, the proposal was almost completely out of the question. Sam declined for that very reason, only for Casey to extend the invitation to Jessica and then another friend. Both turned her down, and although Casey wasn't outwardly upset about the refusal, she was clearly desperate for some company that evening. A few hours later, Casey was home alone, chatting with Scott on Yahoo Messenger while talking with David on the phone. 
David told her that he had a dying aunt in Arkansas, Casey's home state, and that he was driving out to be with her until she passed. Casey expressed her condolences and continued to chat with Scott until exactly 9.41 p.m. when the messages suddenly stopped. Casey's two brothers then returned home at 10.15 p.m. and 11.40 p.m. respectively and contacted their father after becoming concerned at her absence. Rick Woody then raced back home in his squad car and began looking for his daughter. The house showed no obvious signs of a disturbance or break-in, but gradually, Rick began to piece together a series of deeply disturbing clues. Casey's reading glasses, which she used while operating her computer, were inexplicably damaged, while her beloved Yorkshire Terrier appeared to be limping. Something happened in his home, and Rick was sure of it. It had been sudden, it had been violent, and his daughter was in the greatest of danger. Initially, Rick's law enforcement colleagues suggested that Casey had simply ran away. But any such suggestion was met with vehement denials, with Rick insisting his daughter was no more angst-ridden than the next teenage girl. What's more, she might have been liberal with who she was talking with online, but she wasn't foolish or disobedient enough to leave the house without telling him. Detectives then noticed that all of Casey's coats and shoes had been left behind, and given she'd gone missing on a night where temperatures dipped below freezing, it became obvious that she'd been abducted against her will. A huge search effort was launched, with Arkansas State Police being joined by the FBI, dozens of volunteers, and every law enforcement agency in the surrounding Faulkner County. Officers pored over the Woody's computer files, while questioning Casey's fellow students at Greenbrier Middle School. The FBI traced Scott's computer to his home in Georgia, only to discover that he was exactly who he claimed to be. His parents insisted that he was home at the time of Casey's disappearance, and had been worried about her following the abrupt end of their conversation. As a result, he was cleared of all suspicion and became of great help to the overall investigation. When investigators learned that David had been on his way to Arkansas in the hours before Casey disappeared, they began to focus their search around the immediate area for clues of his location. At a nearby Motel 6, uniformed officers discovered a 1993 Buick Regal with California license plates, apparently belonging to a man named David Fuller. Fuller had checked into the motel on December 2nd, having told the clerk that he was planning on a week's stay. He had also bitterly complained about the lack of reliable internet access in his room, something which raised a huge red flag with investigating detectives. Upon an initial search of Fuller's room, police found nothing of interest, but hidden away in the room's closet, they soon found the trash bag containing a ski mask, camouflage clothing, and a pair of rubber gloves. When asked if they had any idea where Fuller might have gone, the desk clerk at the Motel 6 mentioned him asking about local rent-a-car businesses. Police officers drove out to every car rental place in a 20-mile radius. They quickly questioned the staff before moving on to the next until finally they found what they were looking for. A branch of Enterprise in nearby Conway had received a visit from a man acting very strangely indeed. Before signing the name David Fuller on the rental agreement of a silver Dodge minivan, police officers drove out to every car rental place in a 20-mile radius. They quickly questioned the staff before moving on to the next until finally they found what they were looking for. A branch of Enterprise in nearby Conway had received a visit from a man acting very strangely indeed. Before signing the name David Fuller on the rental agreement of a silver Dodge minivan, the man had paced up and down outside the dealership, chain-smoking and muttering to himself. When the minivan was traced to a nearby self-storage facility, Detective Jim Barrett and two FBI agents drove out to investigate it around 6 p.m. on December 4th. When they arrived, one of the doors to the storage units was wide open. The silver Dodge minivan was inside, forward-facing, with its engine running. Detective Barrett approached the unit with his pistol drawn, but the moment he stepped inside, two deafening gunshots rang out. The officers scrambled for cover, barking at their suspect to come out with their hands up. No one responded. Reinforcements arrived shortly afterward. A heavily armed SWAT team poured out of an armored truck surrounded the storage unit and then stormed in with violent precision. There was no resistance. Fuller was lying inside the Dodge minivan, 
The second shot had blown his own brains out. The first had executed Casey. She was lying on her back in the rear of the minivan, which had been converted into a makeshift torture chamber. Her wrists and ankles chained to the floor, and she'd been violated excessively before her sudden execution. Police soon discovered that David Leslie Fuller was born in Salt Lake City, Utah, back in 1955. After marrying a woman named Sally Krenz, Fuller moved her out to coastal Mississippi, where he enlisted in the U.S. Navy. They later moved on to Maryland, had a son and a daughter, before finally settling in California. As the marriage went on, Fuller developed severe behavioral problems and began exhibiting wild mood swings. His wife also noticed that he was spending an increasing amount of time online and would sometimes take walks around the neighborhood at night while talking on his phone. He also became increasingly defensive when asked who he was talking to, and Sally began to doubt that the nature of the calls were less than innocent. After his wife filed for divorce, Fuller moved into his own apartment in La Mesa, California, and was later arrested after violently attacking his wife and children. During the incident, Sally Krenz had locked herself and her children in a bedroom, only for her soon-to-be ex-husband to take it off the hinges with a screwdriver. Following the arrest and the imposition of a restraining order, Fuller's life entered a sharp downward spiral. He was later detained on suspicion of exposing himself to two young girls and was later fired from his job as a used car salesman after being caught watching adult content on his work computer. Following his death, the FBI quickly obtained Fuller's personal computer. Its hard drive contained numerous pictures of Casey, along with a detailed list of her friends' names, their phone numbers, and their addresses. It also became apparent that, from the winter of the year 2000, Fuller had attempted to groom at least three other girls in Casey's age group. Thankfully, none of these interactions led to a face-to-face -face meeting, but not for David's lack of trying. In one instance, he'd offered to pay for a girl in Michigan to fly out to California, and although she'd never given David her address, he somehow found a way to have flowers mailed to her family home. Investigators also discovered that David had visited Casey's hometown twice during the fall of 2002, with the trips amounting to in-depth reconnaissance. Some even theorized that David had been inside the Woody's family home on the night Casey and Jessica detected an intruder, and if it wasn't for the unexpected presence of a friend, Casey would have been taken far earlier than December. Following the taking of his own life, David Fuller was cremated and interred at Wasatch Lawn Memorial Park in Mill Creek, Utah. Outlived by both his parents, they initially refused to believe reports of their son's crime. It was only later, when compelling evidence was presented to them, that they accepted the monstrous things he'd done. Casey's funeral was held on December 9th of 2002 at South Crossroads Church Cemetery in Rosebud, Arkansas. After being laid to rest next to her mother, Casey's two friends, Sam and Jessica, delivered a brilliantly poignant but melancholy eulogy. When the two girls learned of their friend's death, they held each other and wept. Yet as they wept, it began to snow outside. Jessica recalled that in the days prior to her death, Casey had expressed a desire to see the snow that year. Its sudden appearance was no coincidence. It was Casey, reaching out to them from beyond the grave cold comfort for close friends. In April of the year 2000, Raymond Chan received a call from an old high school friend who by that time was studying at Texas A&M University. Raymond was pleased to hear from him, but the conversation soon took a somber turn. An old classmate, Carrie Kuyava, had been found dead on a remote ranch in Texas Hill Country. He was so badly decomposed that it was difficult to ascertain his identity, and the story behind his death horrified his already heartbroken family and friends. It was discovered that Carrie had been in an online relationship with a person calling themselves Kelly McCauley. Kelly claimed to be a pre-law student trapped in a toxic relationship with a violent boyfriend, and although their friendship began as platonic, it quickly blossomed into a long-distance romance. One night, after Kelly spoke of a particularly frightening incident with her boyfriend, Carrie became determined to rescue her. 
The next day on April 7th of the year 2000, Carrie departed his campus home, headed for Kelly's hometown of San Antonio. Carrie informed his parents of the trip, initially informing them that he'd be gone for a week. Then, after eight days of no contact, Carrie emailed them to say that he was fine but would be staying in San Antonio a little longer. There was talk among Carrie's friends that he was soon to be married and they regaled each other with stories of his whirlwind romance with the continually mysterious Kelly. In reality, by the time the email was sent on April 15th, there's a chance that Carrie was already dead. After becoming concerned regarding Carrie's prolonged absence from school, Carrie's family filed a missing persons report with the Brazos County Sheriff's Department, who in turn began coordinating with their San Antonio colleagues. Obviously, law enforcement's primary person of interest was Carrie's love interest, Kelly. But as they began to investigate, it soon became obvious that she was not who she purported to be. After interviewing several frequent visitors to the chat room the couple visited, police obtained Kelly's phone number and address. And this is how they discovered that Kelly was actually 31-year-old Kenny Lockwood, a former McDonald's employee who lived in his parents' basement. He struck a rather unassuming figure, having no prior record and a penchant for computer science. But after hours of heavy questioning, Kenny began to crack. He admitted to fabricating Kelly in order to flirt with younger men on the internet, having concocted an entire life story for her to seem more convincing. Carrie's sudden appearance in San Antonio had surprised him, but instead of admitting to his deception, Lockwood met up with his unwitting e-boyfriend under the pretense of being Kelly's brother. Lockwood then drove Carrie out in the middle of nowhere, to a long abandoned ranch, and on their arrival, he pointed to one of the empty buildings. Kelly was inside, he claimed, hiding from her abusive boyfriend, and she needed Carrie more than ever. Carrie got out of Lockwood's truck and began walking towards the house. Lockwood walked up behind him for a minute before he quietly pulled out a large caliber pistol and shot Carrie in the back of the head. To delay the discovery of the murder, Lockwood sent the reassuring email to Carrie's parents using their son's email address. Then, shockingly, he went right back to assuming the role of Kelly online. It's clear that Lockwood was and remains a dangerous psychopath. But how did the person like Carrie manage to fall for such a terrifying ruse? According to his friends, Carrie was highly intelligent, but also socially proficient. He wasn't some nerd desperate for female attention, nor was he ignorant to the dangers of online relationships. He was a logical, level-headed engineering student, but still he'd fallen for Lockwood's deadly ploy. Mediums of online communication have become increasingly sophisticated in recent years, offering people from opposite sides of the globe a chance to talk in real time. But they also allow people to communicate completely anonymously. And while this might be a net positive for society as a whole, there will always be those who abuse such privilege. For example, child predators have a much easier time stalking and grooming potential victims in anonymous internet chat rooms. But while the need to protect our children from such people remains an obvious one, Perhaps it's adults who should practice a little more caution. As early as 1999, the U.S. Attorney General warned of how severe instances of cyberstalking could be and expressed a deep concern over its potential for growth. He cited reports stating that one in 12 women have experienced stalker-like behavior at the hands of a man and explained how such people could quite easily exploit the anonymity and accessibility of the Internet to update their harassment techniques for the digital age. The Attorney General also warned against dismissing cyberstalking as relatively harmless and argued it was often a prelude to tangible harassment or assault. The following year, the research group Crimes Against Children provided a shocking insight into both the prevalence and severity of the online predation of children. With congressional funding, the group interviewed exactly 1,501 children between the ages of 10 to 17. Approximately one in five were the subject of inappropriate online solicitation or approach within the last year, while one in 33 were asked to meet in person by a complete stranger who also offered them money or gifts in exchange for meeting face to face. Despite these numbers, only between three and nine percent of all instances of harassment were reported to parents, the police, or the relevant internet service provider. What's more, 
The sudden growth in such incidents paint a grim picture for the far more advanced internet of the 2020s. From 1996 to 1999, attempts by online predators to contact children had risen from 113 to just under 1,500 cases, and of those stats ballooned by almost 1,400% in just three years, we can only imagine what that must be in the present day. Clearly, such statistics prevented the serious threat to the safety of children worldwide, but the Attorney General touched on another issue, one which was overshadowed by the more sinister threat to children. Deviants and criminals weren't simply using the internet to anonymously harass people, they were setting up so-called honeypot scams, where beautiful women, either real or fictitious, are used to lure in the lonely and lustful. Little did the Attorney General know that this small part of his cited report would balloon into a large-scale issue for online communities and become colloquially known as catfishing. Since internet users quickly adopted a robust attitude of trust but verify when it came to interacting with strangers online, predators needed a different approach. Instead of hunting for potential victims, they began phishing instead. They'd set up a fake social media profile, usually involving photographs of an attractive photogenic individual, and then place the profile in a position to be observed by others. This less direct approach has proven extremely effective for many who've employed it, so much so that it's not just young boys and girls who fall victim to such ploys, it's grown adults as well. Carrie isn't the only adult male who'd been lured to their doom, and other such catfish murders have occurred deep into the age of internet safety. Yet just a cursory analysis reveals some depressingly terrifying conclusions. In the past, predatory killers were forced to exploit a person's physical vulnerabilities in order to dominate and murder them, whereas in the age of the internet, a person can exploit another's emotional vulnerabilities in order to take their lives. It's ironic that the smaller the world gets, the more isolated we're becoming. We can talk with almost anyone in the world at the drop of the hat, Yet it's the terminally online who often profess deep feelings of loneliness. And while such a phenomenon continues, there will always be those willing to take a terrible advantage of it.